Hey everyone, Ryan here. Today's podcast is about backcountry filmmaking and photography, but first I want to talk about the 2019 Backpacking Light Adventure Film Festival. We are holding a private screening for all BackpackingLight.com members November 29th through December 2nd. So if you're a BackpackingLight.com member, here's your chance to screen all 11 of this year's official selections and vote for the films that you think are worthy of our coveted Members' Choice Award. If you're not yet a member, be sure to join today at backpackandlight.com slash subscribe. Once the voting is complete, we'll announce the date for our public live festival premiere, so stay tuned for that. All this stuff is going to be announced via our email newsletter, so be sure to subscribe at backpackandlight.com slash newsletter. Save the date, November 29th, the 2019 Backpack and Light Adventure Film Festival. Okay, let's get on with the podcast. Welcome to the Backpack and Light podcast, where we discuss the philosophy and skills of traveling light so you can experience the outdoors with more comfort, more safety, and more enjoyment. I'm Ryan Jordan. And I'm Andrew Marshall, and we are your hosts on this lifelong journey of doing more with less as we venture into wild places and empty spaces. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way. of mine every day Today's episode is about photography and filmmaking in the backcountry. Now this is an exciting episode for me because I was a documentary filmmaker for public television in my first career and photography is still very much a large part of what I do today. Yeah, it's definitely one of the extra activities I get really excited about in the backcountry. And I've been interested in photography for a long time and have been interested in filmmaking for the past couple of years. So yeah, this is this is a cool topic for me as well. Well, we're really going to dig into the nuts and bolts of things in a little bit. But to start out with, we have a really cool interview and I'm psyched to get to it. So Ryan, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest? Yeah, our guest today is Chris Mead. Chris is a tech industry professional, musician, family man, ultralight backpacker, and filmmaker, of course. And he's been a member of the Backpacking Light community for a long time. We've had the privilege of premiering several of his short films about the outdoors at backpackinglight.com and in our film festival. So with that as an intro, let's get right into the interview. Chris, thanks for joining us on the Backpacking Light podcast today. Hey guys, thanks for having me. So my first question is, tell us a little bit about your background, your experience with wilderness backpacking and the outdoors. Has this been like a lifelong pursuit or something that came about later in life? It's, I've always enjoyed the outdoors. I've been a huge hiker ever since I was like, I don't know, I think I discovered it when I was maybe 10 years old or something. And I always lived near hills. So I was lucky enough to be able to hike whenever I wanted to pretty much. And but it was mostly day hikes, and I didn't really discover backpacking until I was uh, until about 2004. And then since then, it's been I've been heavy into it. I've been loving backpacking. I've logged uh, between 65 and 70 trips now, so definitely a big passion. So I had the opportunity and privilege of hiking with you in the Black Ridge Canyons wilderness over on the Colorado Plateau last spring, and you made a movie about that hike called Alcove, which made its world premiere at BackpackingLight.com. And we'll go ahead and put a link to Alcove in the show notes. But tell us about your experience in filming this movie in an environment that was completely new to you, the desert. Well, that was definitely uh, a crazy experience for me. Um, first, it was really out of my comfort zone in a lot of ways. I was I was mostly experienced with the Sierra Nevada. And uh, that is that that's my home. I know that place in and out. But I'd never really hiked outside of the Sierra, not very much at least. And that environment was brand new to me. Didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know Ryan. He could have been a crazy psycho killer for all I knew. Um, luckily, luckily, he turned out to be a cool guy. And on top of that, we were we were filming a uh, you know we were making a film, and the camera that I got was um, <laughs> it was my first real camera, and I think I bought it about a month before the trip. So I didn't really know how to do it. Uh, I didn't really know how to use it. And uh, yeah, that was certainly a big learning experience. But considering all that, I think it turned out pretty well. I think the movie turned out great. What would you do differently if you had to repeat that trip again? I would definitely redo the audio. I would definitely bring a better audio setup and uh, use use better stuff for that. So Chris, your film Ray Lakes won the Backpacking Light Member's Choice Award at the first ever Backpacking Light Adventure Film Festival in 2017. 
Can you just tell us a little bit about that film, why you made it and what it means to you? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, thank you for, you know, to everybody who voted for that film. I, I worked pretty hard on it and it's pretty cool to see that people actually appreciated it. So thank you for that. Um, that film was, well, <laughs> it kind of represents my my marriage in a lot of ways. Uh, my wife, Muzzy, is not... <sighs> I got to be careful when I say this stuff. She's not the most adventurous person and she's definitely not an avid outdoor outdoorsman by any means. And dragging her out there was a several year long argument. <laughs> and when I finally got her to agree to it, it was a, a huge win for me. So I was pretty happy. And uh, what I didn't know, well, I knew the area very well. I had been there multiple times and I was, I was able to plan out the shots because of that. And so the film came together pretty quickly, but the thing I was not able to plan ahead of time was the weather conditions and the snow levels. And I think my wife actually learned about the high snow levels while we were shooting the pre-interviews for the film. So if you see her kind of react funny in the film, uh, that's that's legitimate. That's that's a real uh, real reaction of hers. <laughs> um, yeah, we found out that it was a really high snow year, and that was a bit shocking for her. But in the end. I think she was glad that she went. I don't think she would do it again, but <laughs> it, you know, in the end, it worked out. It looks like you guys were on some pretty exposed uh, snow slopes that were pretty steep, right? We were. So Glen Pass, for those who know it, is typically not a dangerous pass. It's pretty round. It's 12,000 feet. It's not like you're on a hardcore knife edge where there's a cliff on either side. But when it's covered with snow, it's a different story. And that's that's something that I'm used to, and it's not that big of a deal to me. I'm totally cool with it. I think a lot of backpackers are used to that, but my wife was not. And before the trip, she saw me packing like the, you know, the ice axe and the and the crampons and stuff. And she's like, What's that for? I'm like, oh, don't, don't worry about that. It's just a, uh, you know, yeah, it's nothing. Just just in case, you know. And luckily I had them because we definitely needed them. And um I, I had walked my wife you know through how to use them. And she was able to do it, and we were able to get down safely. And it wasn't it wasn't Everest, right? But it was definitely enough to spook her pretty bad. Sure, it's out of her comfort zone. It was. <laughs> so, so that kind of leads into my next question. Um, that was an interesting moment watching the film because what I was thinking about was, was you as a filmmaker and as a husband – how do you prioritize those two different tasks on that particular trip? And in other words, when do you put the camera away? Oh boy, this will be good. <laughs> You've been talking to my wife, haven't you? So <laughs> I think as a husband, like you kind of learned, at least I kind of have learned to ride that line between being annoying to her and then pissing her off. <laughs> and, I, and I definitely rode that line on, on this trip. I didn't, when you have a camera in, in somebody's face, I learned that they tend to be a little bit more um, forgiving. They tend to be a little more kind <laughs> in their responses. So I think because of that, I was able to, to keep the camera on her a little bit more than anticipated. Um, but yeah, it, there was definitely points where I had to put the camera down when she got really upset. Um, I, it, t again, to me, this kind of stuff is not scary to, to Ryan, to other backpackers. This stuff isn't scary, but to somebody who's brand new to it, looking over the edge and seeing this icy slope that you have to go down, it yeah, it definitely spooked her. And that I had to be, which is great film, right? But I unfortunately did have to put the camera down several times. And I'm glad that I did uh, save my marriage. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I had to ride that carefully a little bit. That, obviously, that's a, a huge part of filmmaking is knowing when to film and when not to film. Even when you're, whether you're with your wife or or on a project uh, with other people, um, it's an art form knowing when to put the camera away and when to keep it out. Right? It is, but every time I always regret not leaving the camera on. I know. So just I keep it down regret. at your hip and let the red light. Blink. Oh yeah, <laughs> shoot from the hip. Right. That's another meaning to that. So are you trained as a filmmaker? How did you get interested in filmmaking? I am absolutely not trained as a filmmaker. Uh, <laughs> it's weird to even call myself a filmmaker. But in 2006, I did the John Muir Trail. And I brought a camera along. And then when I was done, I ended up with all this footage. And I just started editing it. And it was such a, an awesome experience to me that I really wanted to commemorate it as best that I could. And I was not a camera guy at all. I brought this tiny little camera and I kind of shot it all. And I just, I didn't know what was going to happen with that footage, but I spent all this time editing it. 
And then at the end of that, I had a film and I was like, crap, I'm a filmmaker, I guess. And then uh, I sent it over to you guys to Backpacking Light. And you guys were kind enough to publish it. And then it got all these views and people seemed to like it. And that what kind of film stuff. was that? That was uh, what we should know this, man. <laughs> um, that was the John Muir Trail, according to Chris. Which all is right. On, yep. on YouTube. Yeah. We'll link that down in the show notes as well. Yeah, I was definitely brand new at everything at that point. And uh, yeah, that was it was fun to make. It was a challenge, but it was fun to make. So you were brand new at that time. So let's talk a little bit about what your learning curve has been. Uh, what's, what's your journey been as since that time to now? Oh, it's been crazy. Really, ever since that came out, and I think I released that in December of 2016. Yeah, December of 2016. Um, it's just been crazy. Like It seems like every day is consumed with film. And it, it's a really fun hobby, you know, and it's it's just very, it takes over your life <laughs> for sure. And uh, the progression has been, you know, I'm not trying to like brag or whatever, but but I think for anybody first getting into film, getting from like, zero to 70% good can happen really fast. But getting that last 30% can take decades, right? I'm definitely not there. But as far as getting from my, you know, to that 70% good mark, I think I'm at that point. And then it's from here on out, it's going to be like decades of improvement. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. What's the best mistake you've ever made while learning your craft? Uh, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to say the best mistake I ever made was Editing my own footage. Yeah, that's a good answer. Editing my own footage. In the end, that's that's when you're piecing things together, right? And because of that, your mistakes get thrown in your face. So every time I move the camera around too fast or I didn't hold it steady or I overexposed it or whatever, those become not somebody else's problems but my problems. And they take hours and hours and hours to try to fix, if you can fix them. So yeah, I would say uh, editing my own footage was my biggest mistake and also uh yeah a good thing in the end because you still edit your own footage correct i do yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. do you in in that process do you have trouble cutting things shots that you particularly like but they may not be working in the edit uh yeah yeah both both of those problems actually where i'll have a shot that i really like but it just doesn't fit in the story or it's just too out of place it's too jarring of, of a of a cut to go to that shot so i i won't use it which is a bummer because i'm like man i like that um on the opposite side of that i have definitely had shots that i needed to use because they were critical to the story but I, but they were bad shots. They were shaky. I wasn't, I wasn't framing it right. I didn't compose a shot right, whatever. And uh, I've had to make that work. And that's really how I discovered animation. So what is your process? How do you generate ideas for the films that you make? And what's your journey from zero to festival submission? I'd like to say that I'm this big fancy artist and I have this vision and I go out there and I plan everything around that. I'm not. <laughs> I'm a backpacker. I'm a backpacking geek. And I basically plan a trip. And then afterwards, I'm like, hey, I should probably film this. And then I start thinking through that process of what stuff should I bring? What shots do I want to get? Is, what story do I want to capture? Do I need to catch, capture any shots beforehand afterwards? And I kind of build the story from that. Okay. So let's talk about some practical nuts and bolts when it comes to backcountry filmmaking. What do you think is the biggest challenge of filmmaking in wild and remote places? I think there's two obvious major barriers to what I do to, to filming in the outdoors like this. Uh, the first is getting a film permit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot of people just don't, right? They just go out there, but uh, per wilderness regulations, you're supposed to have a film permit. And I'm kind of I'm kind of weird about rules. I don't want to be a rule breaker. <laughs> and it's just, I have a hard enough time sleeping. I don't need that on my, on my back too. Yeah. So uh, I just try to follow the rules and getting a film permit can be a serious challenge. Um, I've, I've kind of learned the little nuances of how to, to, how to get one, but that was definitely a major um, barrier to begin with. So getting a film permit is definitely barrier number one, challenge number one. Challenge number two is the, I think, the more obvious one to the backpacking light audience, which is the weight. Uh, I am very ultralight as much as I can be. And I, because of that, it's been great because I've been able to carry extra weight like camera stuff. But that camera stuff is tough because, you know, a, a single lens will weigh more than my tent. 
And then if I'm on a trip where I have multiple lenses, plus a camera, plus all the batteries, plus all the audio stuff, it can really add up. So definitely carrying all the weight is a major challenge, uh, but it's also part of the fun, right? You get to kind of be creative. If, we're, if it weren't for those constraints, everything would be easy and then life would be boring. So I want to circle back to the permit issue. I mean, does, does an amateur filmmaker who's just posting their videos on YouTube need a film permit? Anybody going into the wilderness to shoot any sort of film should have a should have a film permit as per the the Wilderness Act. Technically, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit foggy there. So the Wilderness Act says that there's no commercial activity allowed in the wilderness unless it's under permit, and there's very specific rules about that. For example, you can't show any product logos, you can't endorse any products out there. It can't be a commercial by any means. It needs right. to be, it, yeah, it needs to serve the the purpose of wilderness and. If you if you make a film that conforms to all that, then getting a permit is is a, a possible thing. But you definitely have to be careful, and you there's definitely some uh, yeah you, you have to be on the good side <laughs> pretty much to get a film permit. So amateurs don't have an issue, but when they start saying you know this film was sponsored by so and so, then it starts to become a problem. The sponsor thing is an issue, and do t- so. The lines between non-commercial and commercial are a little bit fuzzy these days because of YouTube, right? If you put any, you could, you could take a video of your dog and put it on on YouTube, and if it gets a bunch of hits and you monetize it, it's a commercial deal, right? You're right. making money on it. Yeah. So if you go if you go in the wilderness and you shoot some basic footage on your iPhone, piece it together, put it on YouTube, and then it gets some hits, or even if it doesn't get any hits, and you hit that monetize button, then you're making money, and now it's a convert it's a commercial deal. So technically, it's not allowed. Technically, you're breaking rules there. Um, that said, tons of people do it all the time, and they're not going to catch everybody. Just like on the freeway, there's tons of people going 67 miles an hour. They're not going to get in trouble, probably. But in the end, if you really want to follow the rules, it's it's a good idea to get a permit. And just to clarify, when you, when you say wilderness, you're talking about wilderness designation as decided by the U.S. government, not not wilderness broadly speaking, right? Uh, fairly broadly speaking, if it's private land, it's, you know, you can do whatever you want to, but BLM, national parks, state parks, any of that kind of stuff, you definitely need a permit for sometimes. And depending on the, the management, it it can be easier. Like like national parks are always going to be the hardest Mm -hmm. because they get the most visitors, but uh, a national forest is a lot easier. So it just, it depends. And what are some of the nuanced little tricks that you've learned to get those permits through? Can you share them with us? <laughs> uh, yeah. So make sure that your film serves the point of wilderness. There's some, there's some documentation you can read up on online, but just make sure that you're not endorsing any products. You're not showing any logos and that you are there to serve the point of wilderness, which is to uh, either provide some sort of educational value or um, you know, encourage people to go out there, that kind of thing. So if, if you're making a documentary on two guys that are having this crazy adventure and then they end up killing each other or whatever, that's that's not going to fly, right? But if you're out there saying we're making a, a an informative documentary, an educational documentary on this area, and we want to show people what a, a beautiful place this is, um, that that is something that that would work. So what are some of your favorite or most used pieces of filmmaking gear in the backcountry? Do you have a go-to camera or a favorite lens? That changes all the time, but right now my my favorite camera is definitely the A6500, the Sony A6500. Um, it's just smaller than my A7R2. It's really good at video. It's actually better at video, I think, than the A7R2, uh, the, the bigger camera that I have. And uh, it's just, yeah, just overall, it's just a good camera. Um, favorite lens. I mean, I don't know how geeky you want to get on this podcast, but I've been liking my my Sigma 30 millimeter lately. Um, it's a pretty affordable lens, but it's just, it's a really fast lens. You can get a really good shallow depth of field. It's really good in low light and it's fairly lightweight for backpacking. Yeah. The answer is we want to get as geeky as possible. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so on my last trip, we actually brought 11 lenses. So I won't detail all of those, but Overall, yeah, the, the Sigma 30 millimeter is definitely my, my favorite lens because it's a good focal length for all round stuff. If you're, you could shoot interviews with it, you could shoot, you know, some landscape and you can get some good, uh, even some close up type shots with that. That said, 
I bring a variety of lenses. I bring, I've been bringing a macro lens lately, which sounds like it's just for bugs and it's not just for, it's not, not just for bug pictures. It's also great for a lot of other things. Whenever you need a good shallow depth of field or you want to get tiny details like that, that little zipper on your tent or something like that. Um, Scabs and, and lens. Uh, it, ew, if you want to get that crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, a telephoto lens is, is a nice to have. And I did bring one of those on my last trip, and uh, yeah, kind of a hassle, but they they can be really rewarding if, for wildlife. And then overall, just being out there, it, you're out there in this wide world, right? So I, th- I feel like you need a, a wide lens to capture most of that. So I, I tend to like wider lenses for that purpose. What do you use at the widest end? Uh, I have a 10 to 18 millimeter Sony lens. That's such a nice and- lens. It's a great lens. It's wide as heck. And I learned that the wider you go with a camera, with a, with a lens, the more distortion you get. So you really have to be careful. You have to be careful with, with how you move the camera, right? If, you, if you're panning left to right with a wide lens, you can get this weird distortion-y thing that happens on the sides. Um, but if you're just walking straight ahead, straight ahead with it, then it's a lot less noticeable. So yeah, overall, I learned you just have to be careful with that. But um, if you want to be safe, 16 millimeters is is a, a much safer focal length, so you don't end up with crazy, crazy weird distortion on the sides. Now, you used uh, GoPros in some of your older films, including Alcove. Are you still using them? I am. I really am. And GoPros are awesome. I feel like they're just a great tool to have because you can put those things where most cameras can't go. You could put you could put them underwater, and they they actually capture a pretty good image underwater. You could put them in little rock crevices that you can't fit them in. And recently, uh, well, lately, I've, I've been taking a GoPro and putting it on top of a small gimbal and then putting that on top of a trekking pole. Mm, and cool. w- yeah, and with that, you end up with this cool little monopod thing that where you can get high aerial shots that, that really resemble drone shots in a lot of ways. So you can get a drone-like shot without breaking any wilderness regulations. Right, that's great. And like I said, I don't, I don't like to... I try to avoid breaking rules wherever possible. And that that's a cool way to, uh, you know, get around it without breaking any rules. That's a great idea. What do you do for sound while you're in the field? That seems to change every trip. Uh, I, I've been working with some sound guys lately and they recently recommended a, a new setup. Actually, the mic I'm talking through right now is the Sennheiser 8050. And I have, uh, in the field, I use that into a Tascam DR100 Mark III. And uh, for for dialogue, I, I use that um, for for the more formal interviews, I guess, where you actually have time to set up an audio setup for that. And um, for ambience, I just use the built-in mics on the the Tascam. There's built-in stereo mics there. And uh, I also carry a little Zoom H1N1. The sound guys I know actually recommended against it, but it's just, it's so small and tiny that it's easy to keep in your pocket. So if you're walking by some stream and it sounds pretty, you could stop and just pull it out and record that, that audio. Yeah. I've, I've had great success with that little recorder. I think it's for the, for the performance to weight benefit you get from that. It's pretty remarkable. Again, it's not, not going to do what the bigger guys do, but man, it's what two and a half ounces or something like that. Super lightweight. The batteries last forever. It's tiny. It's just it's good for ambience and for like Foley and cool sounds like that. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunately not good for, for dialogue. You can't really plug in any external mics. You can plug in a lav mic if you want to, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not really cut for that in my opinion. So you obviously write, direct, and shoot your films, but you also edit, you do motion graphics, you compose and record the score for them. What's your favorite part of the whole process? Like if you had to do one thing and then outsource the rest, what would it be? Uh, man, that's, that's definitely, so my, it's kind of a tie, you know, I, I really like the editing and I, I love the shooting of, of the, you know, of the films because I get to be out there in the wilderness and seeing it. I like, I actually like the planning process. I like the editing and I like the, the motion graphics part of it. The composing the musical scores is really fun too. And I do like it, but it takes so much additional time. And I think when I have a film that's too much me, it's too much Chris, um, it's easy to get sick of it halfway through editing. Right. So I, I think even with Alcove, I think halfway through that thing, I'm like, uh, there's too much Chris in here. This is Chris, everything, Chris cameras, Chris, you know, Chris talking, Chris music. And so recently I've been, I've been cutting the, uh, the films to 
scores written by other people and, you know, mostly friends who write music. And that's been really refreshing in a lot of ways because the music for me, at least really influences the cut. Like if it's, if it's fat, fast, cut, fast cut music, I will end up cutting the film fast. If it's slow, I might cut slow. It's, it really just influences the whole project. It's a good sonic foundation to everything. And having somebody else's input in that really helps switch it up and, and add some creative diversity, I think. So do you feel more at home behind the camera or in front of a computer? What do you like better? Definitely prefer to be in front of a camera. Um, out in the wilderness, for sure. <laughs> but that said, it's it's such a personal thing to make a film. And I feel like if I shot all the footage and somebody else cut it, they might not cut it the way that I want, you know? And not, not to get picky, but like, you know, they might... It, they, what if they cut it different? What if they leave out that shot that it worked really hard on? So I, I tend to be a little uh, protective over the footage. And, and the way to do that is to edit everything myself. Plus, it saves a lot of money. <laughs> so filmmaking is generally considered a collaborative process. You do a lot of the work yourself, but you do work with some other folks. So tell us a little bit about your favorite collaboration so far. Yeah. So when I started this, it was, you know, it was tiny and it's still tiny, but it was it was just me with a laptop and a camera just kind of trying to piece stuff together however I could. Um at the time, I was calling myself Chris's Awesome Productions, so that can give you an idea of how serious I was about <laughs> about all this stuff. <laughs> um, I ended up making some friends after uh, after the first couple of my projects came out. A few people reached out, and because of that, I ended up collaborating with a lot more people, um, which is pretty cool. It's nice to have the additional feedback. Um, I'm working with different musicians, for example. I'm working with uh, the the composer from Tiny Lunatic. He's composing the score for my my current project I'm working on. Uh, my last project was scored by uh, a band that I knew, and uh, they in in that case for the High Sierra Trail they had they had actually written the music already, so it was pretty easy. I just had to remaster it for for film purposes. And then for the current one, um, the guy, the current project I'm working on called Highline, um, the guy is actually writing the music for the film. So it's kind of cool. It's a lot more custom to to the scenery. And uh, so that's great. Working with those types of individuals adds a lot more creative input. And it's a lot more to work with. Um, and then I'm also working with a, a colorist now, a guy named Bruce Goodman, and he has colored all sorts of major Hollywood productions, uh, including a Mile, Mile and a Half, which is that big famous film about the John Muir Trail. And uh, he's been awesome to work with, and it's kind of cool to see what he can do with with your footage. And then I'm also working with uh, the uh, two two sound guys that are pretty big in the industry as well. They they worked on uh, everything from like Fast and Furious to Mr. Robot, the series Mr. Robot. And uh, they're big outdoors people as well, and they've, they've been doing a lot of post-audio uh, work for, for, uh, for my projects. And um, actually, I should mention too, on the last project, the, the project I'm currently working on, I collaborated with uh, the head of the, the director of video at Stanford University. He ended up coming out on a hike with us and helping me shoot this new film called Highline. So Chris, your films are very personal. Can you just talk about why that is? I think backpacking is kind of a personal thing overall. I think if you just went out there and took a bunch of videos of, of a mountain, it would be, it would be pretty. But if you weren't there, it might not really make sense to you if you're just watching it over an iPhone screen or whatever. So I think that you you kind of need that human element to help convey that story, to convey the experience. Because it, to me, backpacking is not just about the scenery. It's about the experience overall. It's about, uh, it is about seeing those beautiful mountains and those streams and lakes, but it's also about like weird little nuances like eating ramen or like that, you know, waking up in the morning in your campsite or or weird little things like that. And I think that um, conveying that that personal human experience is, is really vital to making that story relatable to to other people. I think you do a good job at that. It's uh, There's a balance between uh, what's going on in terms of what the human is doing and then um, how the environment in the wilderness is impacting that human. And being able to tell that kind of story on film is really powerful. So what is the best way for a novice to learn the craft of filmmaking? Like I said earlier, I think my one of my biggest things that helped me was editing my own footage, right? So I think, well, I guess to everybody else trying to get into this, if you look in your pocket, there's probably an iPhone that's capable of, of 4K video, right? So I think just shooting your own video on, on a phone 
and just capturing that and then stuffing it into an editor, whether it be like, uh, for example, if you have a, if you have a MacBook, uh, that comes with iMovie, which is a very easy to use editor. If you just start putting your footage into there, cutting it and trying to make a cohesive story, I, I think that's a great way to start. And then from there, you could start building on. You could say like, okay, you know, that, that looks great, but now I want different shots. I want low light shots. I want different angles. I need different lenses. I need a different camera. I want it to sound better. I need different audio stuff. So I mean, it, it can turn into a big consuming beast, right? But I think I think the best way to start if you want to attempt this crazy hobby is to just you know grab your phone, go shoot some video, and then start editing it with your laptop. So how do you balance the ultralight ethos with filmmaking? What compromises, if any, does that involve? What are you leaving at home? What do you don't want to leave at home in order to make a high quality film? Oh yeah, that's a good one. So <laughs> ultralight, I don't, I don't know, I don't know about most people, but I got to a point in ultralight where I was, I was, I saved myself a lot of weight, but then I wasn't able to go any further. Right, I wasn't willing to give up certain things. Filmmaking pushed me to give up those additional things, like for example, a water bladder or a stove. I thought that I needed those things and I kept them on me and I was light I was lightweight everywhere else so it wasn't that big of a deal to carry those things but add a camera to that and a bunch of lenses and batteries and then all of a sudden you're like do I really need this bladder do I really need this stove <laughs> so I I think that ultralight has been really instrumental in helping me to uh do this kind of stuff because without it it, it way too much right and yeah I Going back to your question there, you do have to be very careful about what you bring. And, and you can't just go out and buy the the average videographer's filmmaking kit. It's just not going to work. You can't carry you know, 40 pounds worth of gear on your back. So you have to be very creative and, and learn what works and what doesn't and learn what is multi-purpose. A lot, a, just like backpacking, right? You want most of your, your the things that you bring to be multi-purpose. And the same thing goes with filmmaking. It's like, okay, this lens can also do this and that and that. <laughs> so I'm going to bring that versus those three lenses. And uh, you, you have to make sacrifices for sure. So when you are backpacking and filmmaking at the same time, what is your base weight? It depends on the trip. Uh, for the High Sierra Trail, I think I peaked out at 35 pounds. And that was with 14 pounds of camera gear that was split. Um, I, I carried most of that, but then my, my friend John uh, carried a lot of that as well. So yeah, 35 pounds isn't isn't you know the end of the world. It's heavier than I, I normally like to go, but it, it wasn't that bad because I was ultralight. If I was 35 pounds to begin with, that would have been a major issue. That said, I was just on a 10-day trip with the, the guys from Z-Pax. Uh, and that 10 day trip with, we did have one resupply, but I, I think I maxed out at 40 pounds and, uh, that, that was tough. <laughs> that was not easy. That's 40 pounds with food and filming gear and water and everything. Yes. Everything. Yeah. So what's your preferred, um, post-production workflow? Post-production workflow. Uh, I would say I like to get home and then just kind of dig through the footage and start cutting a trailer not just for promotional reasons, but mostly because I just want to see what I have and kind of dig through it and kind of see, uh, capture a little, you know, start look, exploring the nuances of the story that you might not have realized that you captured. I feel like every time I, I make a film, there's these stories that I didn't realize were there, these little tiny stories that kind of can add some depth to, to uh, the overall production. So uh, yeah, I, I tend to just go through all the footage, cut a trailer and do that. And then later on, I go back and I start going through a piece at a time. And, and I do that chronologically. So I go day one, and then I run to that story, start cutting the footage. Before I started collaborating with other people, like a colorist, I used to grade, I used to color grade and then audio finish along the way more iteratively. And uh, now I just kind of do the whole thing. And then when that's done, then I hand that over to the colorist and then the audio guys afterwards. Do you use... Um... Premiere or Final Cut or what do you like there? <laughs> I use Final Cut. I'm almost embarrassed to say that. Final Cut has a pretty in in the editing geek industry, Final Cut has a bad rap. It used to be really good and then they changed it and then the whole professional industry abandoned it. You're talking about Final Cut X. Final Cut X, yeah. yes. Um, and they all went to Avid. So every every major film production that you see these days is is cut on Avid. And then a lot of the adventure filmmakers are cutting on Premiere. I got into Final Cut just because I did. <laughs> it just kind of worked out that way. 
Um, and I'm, I know it so well that it's very difficult to switch to anything else. For my current project, my new project, I'd intended to cut on Avid, but I just, it was such a massive project. I didn't want it to take any more time. So I just started cutting it in Final Cut and then it's well on its way. So it's, it's going to stay there. <laughs> Speaking of post-production, so your films have this kind of air of, I guess, whimsy is the best word for it. Um, and to me, a lot of that comes from your use of motion graphics. Can you talk about the role that motion graphics plays in your storytelling? I would like to say it's very strategic and artsy, uh, but the truth is that most of my motion graphics come from mistakes. <laughs> I will have a shot that's really messed up. And then I will need to uh, do something about it. I'll have a gap in the storyline and I'll be like, what do I do? Um, so I will I'll animate something and then use that to fill the gap. And then if you just have one animation in a film, it's going to seem really out of place, right? So you, I typically will add them other places. And before you know it, you have this this film that's interlaced between, uh, you know, it, it's a, a mixture of like real footage, some animation, some motion graphics on top of that. And that just kind of became my style. Um, I'd like to say it was all skill, but really it was the lack of skill that kind of led to that. And uh, uh, After Effects? Uh, Motion 5. I do some stuff in, in in After Effects, but most of the work that I do is in a program called Motion 5, which is kind of tied at the hip to Final Cut Pro, also made by Apple. Right. So what do you think makes a good adventure filmmaker or for that matter, a creative of any kind? Is it, is it you as a craftsman or creator? Is it the tools you're using? Is it your outdoor experience and your ability to be comfortable out there? Which do you think are most important to focus on if you're starting out in this area? I think the ability to capture the experience would be number one, in my opinion. I mean, all tools aside, you could take the worst camera in the world and the worst audio stuff in the world and cut it terribly. But if you, if you capture the experience and it feels real to what you, if it feels authentic to what you experienced, I, th I think that's a win. I think that's a big success. And I, I, I would say that's a good uh, judge personally. Uh, that's how I would personally judge a, a good um, you know, adventure filmmaker. Not that I'm qualified to be a judge by any means. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, looking at our film festival and then, um, film festivals, adventure film festivals specifically that I've attended over the past several years, there there is this um, tendency towards amateur film production that is based on whatever footage they happen to capture with whatever camera they happen to have, and it might have been a a cheap old crappy GoPro or a or an an, an iPhone, and then you've you give it to an editor at the end and say, Hey, make a movie out of this. And, and just the fact that the story is so compelling can make some remarkable movies. And this is something that we never really saw in the old days. They were more polished traditional productions. So it seems to me that as the industry explodes and the technology becomes more accessible to people, we see less of an emphasis on like raw cinematic quality, traditional quality, and more on the act of storytelling and creative editing. Yeah. So I think these days, like you said, technology is very accessible. And I think personally, I think that the quality um, part has has been going through the roof. I think overall films have been getting better. And I think the, the bar has been raised in a lot of ways. Um, if you put out a 720p video, people probably aren't going to like it, but everybody's got an iPhone in their pocket with 4K. So that's accessible. But to, to your point, what you were saying, um, the, the emphasis on story, I think, is something that is something that comes from the like the real filmmakers, the guys who like started doing this stuff years and years ago that have decades of experience. And I think that's what most of us have come to associate um, with with pro, with being really engaging and, and good overall. And I think a good example of that is Jason Fitzpatrick's latest film called Unsupported. Yeah, definitely. the guy. The guy took all this footage that was like GoPro footage and like random footage that was taken by not videographers, but just trail runners. Right. And and it was shaky footage, whatever, and he cut it together. And in the end, this shaky footage like blew all of my work away because the story was so compelling. Like like after we screened our films together, and in the end, people were talking about his because it was just so awesome and such a good story. The fact that the, the footage was these random guys running down a trail, carrying a camera that was shaking around, nobody cared about that. They, they cared about 
they cared about the story. And that's what stuck with people. And it, I think that that movie was striking to me because it, it communicated a sense of raw authenticity that seems rare in some films. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, again, story is, is just vital to everything. Telling that story is way more important than production value. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think one thing that's interesting is that you have chosen to document an, an inherently unsexy outdoor sport, right? Like it, backpacking is not as sexy as something like uh, big wall climbing. Right. I'm going to argue that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the wrong crowd, man. I think it's sexy. Yeah, but but so I get well where I'm going with this is I feel like I see a lot of climbing films that they can to a certain extent get away with not focusing on the story and people go kind of gaga over it because the stakes are so high. But um to me that's kind of like a shortcut in, and uh the I see some outdoor adventure filmmakers um, not focusing on telling human stories because the backdrop of where they happen to be is allowing them to get away with that. Yeah, there's not a lot of backpacking films out there. I, and it is it, it is sexy to me and to Ryan and to many people that listen to this podcast right now. But yeah, overall, it's it's a small niche. It's It's not huge. It's not like climbing. I mean, I think with climbing, there's this huge element of danger that the that the average person can kind of see on screen and be like, wow, that's crazy. I'm fascinated. But with backpacking, you're not necessarily hanging off of a wall, right? So there's not that immediate shock value to it that really draws a huge crowd. That said, it's still every every trip's an adventure and it's still a, a very awesome experience. And, and I, I think that's something that we need to convey in some way. I, I didn't I had no idea what backpacking really was. I thought it was just something that Boy Scouts did. And I, I didn't get it at all until I went on my first trip. And then the fir- I remember the first time I went out there, I was like, "Why isn't this stuff on TV more? Why why don't I see this, this like anywhere else?" I mean, you see pictures of Yosemite, but and you see some of the bigger, more fancy, well-known places, but you don't see like these remote places. Why not? And uh, then I started getting into it and, and feeling like it was um, it's a small audience, but I feel like it's a good thing to convey to new people who want to discover backpacking. And it's also a good thing to help other people to remember their trips. For example, if you do a video on the John Muir Trail, people who did the John Muir Trail loved it and they want to watch that video and it helps them remember the experience. And it's just kind of a, a good thing overall. So I think it's worthwhile. As a follow on to that, is, do you feel any um, responsibility as a filmmaker to communicate accurately um, backpacking as an activity or wilderness stewardship or uh, public lands advocacy or anything like that to a broader audience who, you know, may not be engaged in backpacking or the outdoors, but people who could have um, an impact on our activities in the future. I, it's funny, you know, my films have screened in a bunch of film festivals and there's all these documentaries that really have these big, deep political messages or, or messages about waking people up and, and teaching them new things and, and showing people things that they didn't know. I I really haven't just – I'm not really qualified for that kind of stuff, and I'm not really going down that road. But one thing that I really am pursuing is just trying to encourage people to get out there. That's that's the only thing I think I'm qualified to, to tell anybody is that you should get out there. It's amazing out there. And I think that if you're – if you go out to these places and you discover them, you're going to go more often. And then if you go more often, you're going to care about these places. You might take them on as your own. And if you care about these places, then you might be a better steward of that place. You might choose to vote for certain laws versus others to help preserve that place. So I feel like, I, I think it's a good idea to encourage them to go out there. And then after that, it's up to the person. Yeah, that's that's, that's just that's just my take. It's a great approach. I like it. So what's the process for submitting to festivals and have you come up with any kind of hacks that make that a little easier? Because I know that can kind of be a barrier to some people. I think it used to be a big barrier, but right now it's actually pretty darn easy. Uh, I I use a platform called Film Freeway, uh, filmfreeway filmfreeway.com. You upload your film on there, you put a description, and then you kind of search through festivals. And then it's really easy. Just say, you know, click to submit, click to submit. And some of the festivals are free to submit to. Some of them charge you a fee. And then you click and then you wait and you see who picks it up. And uh, the High Sierra Trail got picked up by, I think, 16 festivals so far. So it's a pretty easy thing to do. 
it's not that big of a deal. It's a the bigger challenge is when the festivals come back to you and say, "Hey, we selected you. Can you give us a a different format? Can you give us a Blu-ray? Can you give us a DCP and you know two K at, at this exact format and five dot one specs or whatever? Um, that that stuff can be challenging. But if you're just trying to submit to festivals, overall, Film Freeway is a, a good easy way to do it. So. Speaking of the High Sierra Trail, I had the honor of attending your world premiere of that film last fall um, up in, down in California. And it's it's been really exciting to watch you through the planning, execution, premiere, and now the festival circuit with that film. So I, that's got to be like super rewarding to be um, involved in that process from beginning to end and seeing this film start to receive some accolades and and reach a wider audience probably wider than you've you anticipated with any of your other movies what do you think about that uh it's crazy so the high sierra trail i've seen that thing so many darn times and it was a big learning experience because it was my first endeavor to try to push things beyond um youtube and that that whole experience has been crazy and because i've seen it so many times because i worked with a colorist which made me uh, have to do th- some additional processing on my end. Um, I'm, I'm kind of sick of it. <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm grateful that it's been picked up by all these festivals and it's, and it really is cool to be able to go out there and see people's reactions to your films. Um, but yeah, I, I, if I never see it again, I would totally be okay. <laughs> but, 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 you know, to your point, yeah, it is, it is really awesome to see, um, it reach a wider audience than I expected. And it's getting picked up by festivals that I didn't expect. You know, I, I expected it to get picked up by some outdoor festivals, like festivals focusing on nature and stuff like that. And it's, we just screened uh, a couple weeks ago in, in Boston at some festival um, that was really for more political documentaries. And mine is the, like the most non-political documentary <laughs> you, could, you could think of. And it seemed to go over well. And uh, it screened like five times last weekend in, in different states. And, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of cool. It's it's been awesome, and um, it's a new and exciting thing. And honestly, my I think my my focus now has been more on the next project. So I'm not paying as much attention to the High Sierra Trail as I should be, probably. Maybe your non political messaging in that film appeased audiences who are desperate for a political messaging today. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, what other projects do you have coming up on the horizon? I am currently working on the biggest project of my life. It is huge. There's a lot of hands involved. It is a feature-length documentary on the Uinta Highline Trail in northern Utah, a pretty largely unknown trail. And it follows uh, some pretty well-known backpackers. It follows the founders of Z-Pax, and it follows a guy named Redbeard. You might have heard of him. Uh, and Plug It In Hikes, and uh, a guy named Steve, who was awesome. It follows the five of them over 10 days as we traverse the Uinta Mountain Range. And um, it definitely is my first experience pushing things beyond the trail. So it definitely it definitely goes through the modern experience and the adventures that we had out there on the trail. But it also goes into the history of the trail in the area, which is, there's a lot of fascinating history there. And we interviewed an archaeologist and some other official people to add depth to that story. And then on top of that, the the big component that's new to me is we dived into the personal stories of, of all these people. And they have some very unique, very fascinating, and in some cases, very shocking stories uh, that we're conveying in the film. And uh, that's that's been a, an awesome, fun experience to go out there and shoot it. We, we shot the, the film over 18 days, but only 10 days were on the trail, if that you know, it gives you any context. And we flew all the way around the country. Uh, we, we were in Florida. We were in, in Tennessee. We were in uh, North Carolina shooting this thing. And, uh, my, you know, my, my friend Gordy came out to help shoot this project. And uh, it's it's been awesome to see his creative input on this as well and uh, kind of mixes things up a bit. That's really exciting. I can't wait to see it. Do you have a premiere schedule? Uh, we're planning to release that uh, the summer of next year. So we've, we've got a long way to go, but the trailer was just released. Sounds good. And there's a there's also a Kickstarter for that as well. Awesome. Okay, time for some rapid fire questions. Give us the shortest, lightest answers possible. Are you ready? Uh-oh. Oh, man, you didn't tell me about this part. <laughs> okay. 
Shortest, lightest, lightest answers. That's right. Like lightweight. Lightweight. Okay. I'm an ultralight backpacker and I want to take one tiny camera with me to shoot an epic movie about my trip. What camera should I bring? Sony RX100. Extra batteries, power banks, or solar? Extra batteries. What's the one thing amateur filmmakers can do to improve the quality of their movies? Get a variety of shots. What piece of ultralight backpacking gear is absolutely essential for a filmmaker? Mm, trekking pole. Chris Smead or Jimmy Chin? Jimmy Chin. He's way cooler <laughs> than I am. <laughs> Who's the better hiking partner, Aaron Smead or Ryan Jordan? Uh, Aaron Smead? You are a wise man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a delay there, but that's okay. We'll, we'll recapture all this when we bring Aaron on the podcast. <laughs> Well, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that you haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet? On December 1st, uh, 2018, we are we are holding a huge, big event in LA uh, called the Switchback Showcase. It's a big celebration of the outdoors. It's going to feature a bunch of outdoor films, and uh, it's going to feature the High Sierra Trail and then three films from the Mirror Project. There's going to be live music from Opus Orange. There's going to be uh, tacos. There's going to be beer. There's going to be uh, outdoor-themed art. So um, it's pretty much a big hiker convention type thing. It's a big hikers event festival type thing. And I uh, definitely recommend checking that out, uh, switchbackshowcase.com. And uh, I'll be there. Uh, SoCal Hikers Involved, they'll be there. And it is a benefit for big city mountaineers, so it's all for a good cause. I had the pleasure of attending the first Switchback Showcase in Campbell, California last fall, and I highly recommend attending this event. You'll have a great time. Chris, thanks for joining us on the Backpacking Light podcast. We really appreciate the conversation, learned a lot, and it was great touching base with you again. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Well, I think that Chris's reasons for exploring motion graphics are fascinating. It's such a visual hallmark of his films, but he started doing it as just this need to patch holes in his narrative uh, brought about by mistakes or technical failure. And I think that's really interesting because I think most people don't realize exactly how much of the art or stories they consume are successful because of mistakes made by the creator or in spite of mistakes made by the creator. So the famous example is that animatronic shark in Jaws. You know, the entire reason that film works is that you rarely ever see the shark. But the reason you don't see the shark is because they could never get the damn thing to work right. So basically, my takeaway from this interview is that there's really no excuses. You know, you, if you don't have the gear that you need to tell a certain story, I would really question that perceived need. Um, I would try to tell the story anyway, and you might be surprised by what you get. You know, just get out there and do the thing. Yeah, and that's the avenue I kind of like to explore in the rest of this episode. How can you reduce the barriers to filmmaking and photography in the backcountry? And those barriers might be any number of things. It could be the skills and time required to produce a film or the complexity and the weight and the cost of the gear you're using. So if I were to ask a question that might drive the theme of this discussion, it would be this probably. How can I enjoy backcountry photography and filmmaking as much as possible while adhering to the backpacking light ethic of minimalism? So let's start this conversation just by discussing overall industry trends in filmmaking and photography. And I think gear seems like a logical place to start. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the thing that always strikes me is that we have for for the size of portable cinema cameras that were in, introduced in the 50s and 60s that really brought like mobile journalism to the to the forefront to TV. We have these carryable 8K cameras that can shoot like ultra slow motion for action sports. A, a great example is the Red. And uh, you see this used in like the Red Bull, whitewater kayaking and mountain biking films. And then you've got these drones that can haul these same cameras into the sky for aerial footage that was once only the domain of helicopters. So for, for what can be carried by a journalist or a filmmaker, you have an immense amount of power now. It's really incredible. Yeah, it really is. And the only thing is, of course, that these are super expensive tools for high budget productions. I mean, I don't even know what the what the red camera retails for, but I think it's like it's tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's obviously that's well beyond the reach of an average backpacker. I think we want to make sure we're bringing all of this back to average people like you and I and our listeners. 
So I think the question we really have to ask is what are some good tools that are lightweight, easy to use, affordable, but still maintain a high level of quality? And maybe the avenue to approach that is what are we what are we actually looking for in our tool? Well, every every photographer or filmmaker has different requirements, but I know for me personally, I look at like seven different criteria that I'm interested in, not only in terms of capability of the of the camera, but you know, consistent with my own lightweight backcountry ethic. And so the first one is like water resistance. I never want to have to put my camera away when it's raining or snowing in fear of ruining the camera. I've missed so many good shots and good story moments through the years by not, uh, by being too worried about my, my camera getting damaged in wet conditions. So anymore, yeah. that's like a non-negotiable for me. It's got to be a water resistant camera. It has to have decent sound either, either on board or has to have the ability to plug in an external mic so I can capture good ambient sound, good sound from the people uh, that I'm talking to in the, in the film. Maybe it's my hiking partners. Maybe it's myself. If I'm doing uh, kind of a uh, journal sort of narrative footage. The third thing is that I want the footage to be stable without the use of, you know, a, an expensive, electronic gimbal or anything like that. And I, I have a gimbal and I, I will take it into the backcountry on some trips, but on a really long trip where I'm, I'm really hoping to save a lot of weight, that gimbal is going to stay at home. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take a camera that has some built in stabilization so I can get good footage. And then there's another flip side of that. There's obviously some skills that go along with uh, collecting stable footage as well. Mm. The fourth thing I want is I want the camera to be able to shoot 24p, which is 24 frames per second, which kind of gives that cinematic motion blur quality. I don't like, you know, shooting most uh, consumer grade phones through the years have shot at 30p and it just kind of gives it a sterile look and 24p is, is really pretty, especially outdoors. If I'm doing action sports like pack rafting or mountain biking, I do want the ability to shoot some slow motion. So at least 60 frames per second, 120 is even better. 240, you know, it does not necessary to me, although that, that capability gives you some really cool artistic effects that you could put in your production later. And then the, the sixth criteria would be, and this is really where it gets into the heart of the lightweight ethic. I want it to be small, I, it, lighter, less pack volume, but, and more importantly, lower power requirements. So the fewer batteries I need to take or fewer power banks, I need to take to keep my photographic tool charged up through a long trip is is super important. And then finally, you know, and this kind of is the esoteric part of, of lightweight. I want a rapid, simple workflow that allows me to go from the from image capture to sharing my film online as fast as possible. And so um, a tool that allows me to do that without, you know, too much funky conversion and and the need for high-end editing software and all this kind of stuff is, is important to me as well. Absolutely. So let's start considering what tools we have out there. Um, starting at kind of the top, we basically have traditional DSLR cameras. And when I say DSLR, I'm, re I'm referring to digital single lens reflex cameras. So this is basically what you'll see a wedding photographer carrying around or, or a, a professional photographer really of, of any kind. Um, so these are big, chunky cameras, but the nice thing is in the last few years, the cameras on the smaller end of that family have gotten better and better. So if you're talking about something like the Canon Rebel, um, it's a lot smaller than, than what you'll see, again, like a wedding photographer carrying around, but you still get great performance in both still and motion photography. One thing with um, the, the DSLR is that they still kind of hold one key performance metric. And that is the cost you have to invest to get really nice footage or uh, photographic tools out of it is still the hallmark of the DSLR. I mean, you can buy a DSLR now for less than 500 bucks that shoots 4K. It can interchange with some incredible quality lenses and give you cinematic footage. And it's, it's remarkable how far these have come. So, you know, if I, my recommendation is if you're primarily limited by budget, 
DSLRs are still the way to go. Yeah, and you can go Canon or Nikon. Um, I'm I shoot Canon myself, so I don't know right off the top of my head what the um, what the Nikon version of the Canon Rebel is, but it's out there, and we'll put a link in the show notes to it. Um, the downside, of course, with DSLRs is that because of the way they mechanically function, they still have to be large enough to hold a prism and a mirror. This is kind of what allows them to work the way that they do. Mirrorless cameras, on the other hand, don't have this need, and this allows them to be much smaller and lighter on average. Yeah, and I've I gravitated from DSLRs to mirrorless seven years ago for the exact reason that they're smaller and lighter cameras. And so I've always been a big fan of the uh, four-thirds sensor system. So I've used Olympus and Panasonic mirrorless systems for a long time. And uh, the quality you get out of a mirrorless camera relative to, to a DSLR, that gap has dropped dramatically. Um, but still, you're looking at a tool that is it has interchangeable lenses, so you're, you've got multiple parts in this system. And the bulk of mirrorless cameras, we thought that the bulk was going to decrease over time, and it has for parts of the market, but other parts of the market, it has they become heavier and more capable and higher quality. So on the flip side, for a pro photographer, using a mirrorless full-frame camera like the Sony A7 series, you're looking at a tremendous amount of capability packed into a camera that is easily, um, you know, a camera system with a lens that's a pound or more lighter than similar capability DSLRs. And so for, for me, as I look at this market shifting, um, I see that DSLRs represent uh, the cheaper end of the spectrum and uh, mirrorless has the opportunity to increase the the capabilities for you uh, with with some more expense for sure. There's definitely an expense to size and weight here, uh, but but preserving what you had in the DSLR system. Yeah, the A7 uh, somewhere in the the neighborhood of five thousand dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know there's several models in the line that uh, range. They used to there used to have some models that were in the eighteen hundred dollar range on up, but yeah, the A7 has definitely taken. Um, uh, remote filmmaking, uh, by it has changed things. And I know Chris Smead, he didn't talk too much about the a seven, but that's what he shot most of the movie alcove in. And, uh, it was, it was fun seeing him watch, watch him do that and, and collect footage that, um, you know, even 10 years ago was impossible with a camera that size. And Sony's really been leading the way in the mirrorless market as certainly they were, uh, is that the, um, brand you went with seven years ago when you made the switch? No, I, I started out shooting the Panasonic uh, GH series. And so um, mainly because that was the only mirrorless camera at the time that had high enough bandwidth to produce footage that could hold up in post-processing and, and coloring and things like that. Yeah, Panasonic is right behind Sony these days and, and um, Olympus is too, actually, in terms of mirrorless stuff. I have an A6500 right now and that's kind of my my highest end most capable camera system and so one thing i have noticed through the years is that when i talk about what what i want at the very highest end that camera system has come down in size cost and weight and so now i'm shooting strictly on the a6500 when i'm taking an interchangeable lens camera i don't even own a dslr anymore well, that's actually a good segue into our next family of cameras to talk about, which is pointer shoot or action cams. Um, point and shoots tend to be small and light, usually with a fixed non-removable lens, and some of them have the ability to zoom both optically and digitally. The trade-off, at least in the past, is that you didn't have access to manual settings um, or, frankly, footage quality or sensor size or any of the things that you would need to really get get quality footage. Um, but this is really starting to actually change in the last few years. One outstanding example is the Sony RX100 line, which is a camera, Ryan, that you and I both have a lot of experience with. I love this camera. This whole series, I've, I've owned a couple of different models in the series, and I've tried the latest one that has the, the 200 millimeter zoom reach and an absolutely remarkable tool for a filmmaker because you can shoot uh, flat, ungraded footage in it. You can you can have access to full manual settings. You can put 
filters on the on the front of the lens so that you can use neutral density filters and things like that to make sure your shutter speeds are in line with good cinematic footage. It shoots slow motion, but it's it's kind of funky in how it does it, but it does have that capability. The only thing the RX100 doesn't have that I wish it had was an external microphone input. And so whenever I'm I'm filming with this camera, I do have to record sound on a on a different recorder and then sync in post production. And that is really irritating to me in this day and age. It seems like I should be able to plug an external mic into that little camera. But other than that, I, I have no quibbles at all with that incredible camera and what it can do. Yeah, I actually ran into the same problem with the sound on this camera. I made a little film in Scotland while I was trekking across there a few summers ago, and I ended up just um, dumping all the sound and and actually just buying sound effects and putting them <laughs> on top because yeah, the sound yeah. quality was so bad. But one thing you didn't mention is that this is all of those perks to this camera in an incredibly compact and lightweight package. I mean, it really will fit into it could fit into the front pocket of some pants easily, comfortably. Uh, you can get it in and out of of almost any um, uh, hip belt pouch or anything like that in a snap. It's really great. Yeah, I often carry it in the front pocket of my hiking pants. It weighs about 10 ounces and it's, it's incredibly tiny. Well, another thing that is tiny is um, sort of the action cam line. And I'm really going to have to defer to you on this one, Ryan, because I just don't have that much experience with things like a GoPro. I don't have a lot of experience with cameras, action cameras outside the GoPro line, but I have used GoPro since the very first generation cameras came out. And and I have the current one now, it's the uh, Hero 7 Black. And I love these cameras, especially the new generation that you can use the camera without a plastic housing for a couple reasons. One, they shoot remarkably good uh, flat log footage. And so you can have a, a file that can hold up very well in post-processing. It's very high resolution. You can shoot 4K on these things. Uh, they do slow motion very well, up to 240 frames per second. Uh, you can, if you're if you're really into tinkering with your with your image capture, you can add things like neutral density filters and and things like that on it. And in camera, they actually collect really good sound. And the the, the other real good benefit of the the GoPro that you know the RX100 doesn't have is that you can buy a little adapter and attach an external mic to it if you wanted to. Now, most action cam footage that I'm shooting, I don't care as much about external sound because I, I'm not doing interviews or anything like that in them, uh, but I, I appreciate that it's an option. And so the big thing with the GoPro that I think has a unique advantage over any other camera is that it allows you to put it in places to get some really unique shots. So like one of my favorite ways to use a GoPro is um, turning the record mode on, putting the camera in the bottom of a bear canister and putting some food on it, closing the lid. And then the the shot that I'll use in the, in the movie later on will be uh, the hiker opening the bear canister lid, pulling food out. And then, you know, the GoPro sees this whole process. And so you can, you can put it in some really unique spots underwater. Um, it's a totally waterproof camera and yeah, it just, it just gives you some unique angles that are, that are really neat. At the same time, is it accurate to say that a GoPro might also be in some ways the most limiting in terms of visually what you can achieve because of the fixed wide angle lens? You you do have some flexibility. They they have different modes now where you have kind of this super wide fisheye kind of mode. And then they have, a, the, over the last couple of generations, they've introduced a linear mode that doesn't have the um, the artifacts that come with a fisheye lens. And so that makes the footage look more like just normal wide angle lens. And so, yes, you are limited. It is definitely a wide angle camera. Um, but at the same time, it's a great camera for for vlogging or doing uh, selfies or anything like that uh, because of its wide angle and good sound. Well, speaking of selfies and, and wide angle, uh, the last thing we haven't talked about yet is the fact that essentially everybody is walking around with a miniature film studio in his or her pocket right now. Actually, you're probably listening to our podcast from this device. I'm talking, of course, about your smartphone. Yeah, and you know, this is this is where it's at. This is where it's all going. You know, I look at my current smartphone and I can shoot 
24p cinema footage. I can do 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, slow motion in 120 or 240, 4K. I can uh, change the bit rate of my footage on my phone to 100 megabits per second, which gives me footage that holds up very well in color grading or anything like that. Through third-party apps that I can install on the phone, I can have full manual control over ISO, shutter speed, and, and aperture, and just have this remarkable tool for creating incredibly good quality footage. The cameras and the sensors on these things are improving so much that uh, more and more professional documentary and uh, journalism filmmakers are using exclusively their phones to rapidly create their video footage. And it's, it's wild. And, you know, I, I even have a, a lens set for my, my phone that gives me wide angle tele telephoto and macro. And there's a couple of lens manufacturers out there that even make anamorphic lenses for, for phones. They're easy to put on the very lightest stabilizers and gimbals out there. So you, if you do need a, a stabilizer, you no longer have to carry this five pound behemoth that is required for a DSLR. And you can now carry this thing that weighs, you know, 12 ounces or less to, to stabilize your footage. You can get external audio into the phones through, through the ports and, and hook up professional uh, recording mics to these things. And finally, the, the new series of phones, at least from Google, Apple, and Samsung are all waterproof. And you can do almost anything with these phones that you can do with a GoPro, uh, limited, of course, by the form factor. Yeah, I've definitely seen people use them in the exact same ways that you can, that you can use a GoPro. Um, they don't have quite the internal stabilization that I think GoPros have. No, no, the like new GoPros, action. yeah, the new GoPros have a remarkable internal stabilization. So you can easily, you know, I've done some tests with mine. You could easily run um, after a runner and take footage of the runner in front of you, and you'd think it was on a gimbal. You still can't do that with a phone. Yeah, I mean, I have an iPhone 6, and... Um, I'm a professional photographer. I sell fine art prints from my website and at art shows, and 90% of the things that I sell, I've taken from my iPhone. That's remarkable. Um, That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, and, and, and I blow these things up to 16 by 20 prints, so they hold up really well on a large scale, and they hold up well to, to post-production. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I follow the, the journalism industry quite a bit, quite closely, and and every year, more and more covers of major magazines are shot on iPhone and Time Magazine is a great example. They've had a dozen uh, of their covers now shot on iPhones and it's it's incredible. I remember when I first started uh, as a freelance photojournalist, um, there were very specific requirements from the magazines I worked with regarding, you know, you had to use a DSLR and that your image had to be this uh, resolution and you know if you did any modifications to the image please provide your photoshop file you know this kind of thing mm -hmm. and now that's that's all gone well to me the best part about using your phone as a photography and video tool in the backcountry is that it's a multi-use item you know it, you probably already have it out there with you for maps and navigation and ebooks and communication uh, not to mention you can load it up with post-processing software to edit and create a finished product in the field oh man i love this part of the phone and and yeah, I, I use phone navigation apps. Um, I journal on my phone. Um, I put ebooks on my Kindle app on my phone, which I read at night in my tent. And the other thing I've I put on my phone recently is video editing software. And the chance to review footage and maybe put together a, a short edit at the end of the day, especially if you're out there shooting a film, uh, just gives you... Uh, the ability to review your footage and see if it's going to hold up in a in a in a final product, and if it if it doesn't, as you review it at night and and try to put together an edit, you can always go out the next day and and fill in the gaps. and And to me, that completely changes the game because if you look at filmmaking workflow in general, this is this is kind of how it goes. You know, you shoot a bunch of footage, you offload it into a hard drive, you give the hard drive to an editor, the editor uh, creates a director's cut, the director reviews the footage at night, and then reverses the pro process back up to the, the filmmakers. And so this, this opportunity to capture 
footage and edit it in real time is it changes the game and just makes everything so much simpler and faster. And I think ultimately, once we all get more practice with this, it's going to increase increase the quality of what we're able to produce as normal people without the the need of a production studio. Uh, there's a famous um, Francis Ford Coppola quote, I think, where he says something to the extent of the next um, the next great filmmaker is a farm girl in Iowa, you know, <laughs> who, who doesn't even know it yet. And and it's just like everything else, like books, like like anything in the arts, the technology has allowed um, this creative process to be a lot less difficult to uh, gain access to. Yeah, I look at I follow a lot of film festivals that are iPhone only or mobile only. And just in the last five years, they, the number of these festivals has exploded. But more importantly, the quality of the, the work that is being submitted to these things is outrageous. And I almost can't, I mean, I, I know when I see a movie from Red Bull that's shot on a red camera, I totally understand that <laughs> what they're doing. But from the normal standpoint of mainstream film, um, I'm finding it harder and harder to distinguish between what's been shot on a DSLR versus a mirrorless versus a a smartphone. And so that, to me, is a testament to the quality of the smartphones, the quality of the software that's being used to capture footage, and the ability of these guys to edit the footage. It's it's awesome. Well, let's talk some some practicalities about software real quick. Um, you said you've been playing around with editing on your phone. What have you been using? Yeah, so I, I've been capturing footage using a, a manual capture software called Filmic Pro, and it allows you to control literally everything on the phone. So I can set the shutter speed, I can set the ISO, I can choose the bit rate at which the footage is recorded, I can choose a color profile so I can shoot a good flat log profile that will hold up later in post-processing. and. Uh, the ability to do that because smartphones are so they're 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 automated to allow the everyday person to capture decent quality footage, but some of that automation kind of gets in the way if you're trying to produce good quality film. And so you've got you know once you press the record button, auto exposure takes over and and auto white balance takes over, and you get some funky artifacts. So the ability to fix everything and control it just like you would on a on a normal DSLR is is super valuable because then you can create good, stable, cinematic footage that that you can post process later uh, very effectively. There's another new. There's a number of these apps that allow you to do that. Filmic Pro I found to be the most powerful and one of the simplest to use. There's a new company called Moment out of Seattle. They're a lens manufacturer, but they just released an app that has some of this uh, capability. It's a little bit easier to use. It's faster, but it's not quite as powerful as Filmic Pro. But I've been playing around with that one as well. And then in terms of post-production, you know, obviously every iPhone ships with iMovie, and iMovie is an incredibly capable piece of software. And you can create films for social media or or publishing online with iMovie that are totally adequate, and you can do a very good job. It's a very flexible piece of software. But it's not quite at a at a pro level, and some there's some things you can't do in iMovie that you can do in pro level desktop software, and so I've been using um, a piece of software called LumaFusion, and it is a pro level mobile software platform for editing, and it is it is so fast I can edit uh, 4K footage on my phone in far less time than doing the same edit on a desktop computer. And it's it's just, you know, this this whole thing is changing so rapidly. And to know that we have tools that allow us to to capture good cinematic footage, edit it professionally, and create a a film without <laughs> ever leaving your phone is it's almost blows my mind. From a still photography standpoint, Adobe Lightroom mobile app is a very, very powerful tool. It's easy to use, which, which separates it from Photoshop, which has a much steeper learning curve because it's really designed for other things. Yeah, and so Adobe is doing really awesome stuff in mobile. And on the film side, they have a piece of software called Adobe Rush, which is 
um, a completely stripped down version of Premiere that runs on mobile devices very, very well. And I've had the chance to use it for several edits now. And I love it because if you're doing a very simple rough cut or assembly cut, it is, it is the fastest way to do one of these things. And I, I'm really impressed by it. You can export a Rush project into Premiere and then so you could start it on your, on your mobile device, iPad or iPhone, and then finish up with Premiere on your desktop. And, you know, back to photography, that's one of the things I've always been really impressed about Lightroom on the mobile device as well, is that it strips away a lot of the stuff that allows you to create a good edit very fast. And then if you, if you need to do more fine tuning, you can always use Photoshop, but Adobe has announced that they're going to release Photoshop in 2019 for mobile devices. And that could be a complete game changer because the ability to have a touchscreen interface for something like, photo or video editing, I think is huge. Just sitting here thinking about the workflow of you're out in the woods for four or five days, you've put together a little film on your phone, you've edited it in Rush, and on your way home, as soon as you get back into cell phone range, your phone is connected with Adobe Cloud, and by the time you get home and shower and sit down at your computer, all your footage and your rough cut is already uploaded onto your desktop app. That is just a super cool workflow. It is. That's great. Yep. And it's everything synced. You know, your edits are synced. So, you know, sitting in line at the uh, driver's license bureau, renewing your license, you could be working on an edit. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay. So we're going to continue this conversation by getting into some listener questions. Our most asked question was this, what is the best way to improve my photography and video skills? I think this is a really important question because it, it fits with the backpacking light philosophy of skill being so important. I think that the most important thing is don't get caught up in investing heavily in gear. And I know we spent the first half of this conversation talking about gear and we all love gear, but focusing on improving your skills is going to take you so much further, so much faster than buying the latest shiny new thing that's out. We can apply this strategy to any aspect of uh, backcountry travel, whether it's you know, your general ultralight backpacking kit or your cooking kit or your navigation gear or whatever. Skills will always allow you to carry less and lighter stuff in the backcountry. And that and photography and filmmaking is no exception. Absolutely. The one book that I really recommend is called The Bare Bones Camera Course for Film and Video. But the things that it teaches you can easily be applied to photography as well. These two disciplines are very, very intertwined. And it's a book with lots of illustrations and drawings in it, which is very helpful because this is a visual medium. And it really helps you kind of lock down the science and, and getting a grasp on things like shutter speed and f-stop and ISO. Uh, it also goes into composition, subject matter, point of view. I mean, these things are all more important than what camera you have or, or what kind of gimbal you have. One example that uh, I see a lot of beginning photographers do is sort of standing up and shooting from eye level and that's that's the only point of view they ever shoot from um and once you start laying on the ground and shooting up or climbing up a tree or you know putting your strapping your camera to the side of a bush that's when you really start to see the world in a little more interesting light yeah and i i can echo similarly for filmmaking you know skills are so important and i think if you if you took a, a phone as your primary filmmaking tool and you shot stable footage and you captured good quality audio, assuming you're we're going to do a voiceover music track um, later on, those two things completely changes how people perceive what you've shot. And, and again, it just goes back to skills and intentionality with your shots. And it's just like you said, shooting at eye level. Um, yeah, you can, you can be so much more creative by uh, trying different things. Another thing that's really important if you're looking to improve your skill set is to really understand that your shooting ratio should probably be a lot higher than it actually is. So from a photography standpoint, one thing I tell my students a lot is you should be shooting 100 pictures for every one that you think might be okay. Um, from a filmmaking or video perspective, documentary film, you probably want to be shooting 10 to 15 minutes of footage for every one minute that you think might end up in your final piece. 
that's those are bare minimum numbers. Yeah, for sure. And you know, when when documentary filmmakers were doing budgets, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, the general rule of thumb was you shot an hour of footage for every minute of of finished video. And one of the things that's changing is and it's changing in response to run and gun kind of video filming is um, that that ratio is going down a little bit. So for me in the backcountry, I shoot for you know ten to one or twenty to one. Um, it would be ridiculous for me to shoot for a sixty to hundred to one ratio because I just don't have the time and I don't want to take that time. And so I value like the ability to. Uh, see a moment in the in the backcountry on a trek and say, "Oh man, I I need I need 15 seconds of footage here because I'm going to want to use three of this in a flash cut." And um, that you know you kind of got to get into the mindset of that, and that's that's I think one of these skills that is part of the backpacking light philosophy is just taking opportunities where they come and doing the minimum possible uh, that's required in order to capture that opportunity. The other thing that I would say to really improve your skills is to study and practice. We happen to be living in the golden age of documentary filmmaking. Uh, Netflix and streaming services have changed access to documentaries so rapidly in the last few years. You can also just study Baroque and Romantic painters. I mean, people like Rembrandt, um, even going back to Renaissance painters, they were masters of composition and subject. And all of these things still apply both for photography and filmmaking. That brings up a good point, actually, because whether you're using a canvas to paint on or a, or a DSLR to capture a still image or a smartphone to shoot a film, I always like to remind people to use the right tool for the job. And I think at some level, you have to consider the endpoint. Is, is your media going to be posted on social media to your friends and family? Is that the endpoint? Are you displaying your images in a gallery? Or are you, you know, trying to submit a film to a national film festival? Or are you a pro who is actually trying to make a living at this? And understanding this final endpoint has a huge impact on how much weight you are going to split between your camera gear and the rest of your kit. So for for me, I'm not I don't make a living by shooting film or photography. Um, most of what I do ends up online. And so I'm really intrigued by miniaturizing and lightening my kit as much as possible. So another common question we got was this. I'm an experienced photographer, but I want to start shooting video. What do I need to know? Well, the first thing to consider is that almost all of the skills that you've developed as a photographer, you know, looking at the light, understanding time of day, understanding composition, understanding subject matter, these all still apply to filmmaking. Basically, the only difference is with filmmaking, you have the added element of time. So you essentially can move the camera. You know, you can use, use depth and space, but the important thing is you, you have to do it with a purpose. Um, nothing looks sillier than a camera move that seems unintentional. So if you're panning from left to right, make sure that you are panning from a mountain to something that's actually happening or another subject. Don't just move the camera because it just looks silly. Yeah. In addition to moving the camera, shoot motion, right? So capture the wind blowing leaves around. Um, capture the movement of water flowing over boulders in a river. Capture the movement of a hiker on the trail. That to me is is some of the, the best part of filmmaking is it is movement. And yeah, move the camera or capture movement. Right, it, because movement is time, right? So if you're shooting a time lapse of clouds and a sunset, you are essentially shooting time. So those two things are very intertwined. Um, in terms of editing and post-production, be conscious of rhythm and flow. One thing that you'll see beginners do a lot is match every cut to the beat of their music. There's no greater dead giveaway to a beginning editor than that. Um, <laughs> it, it just feels so good as an editor to do it, but you have to fight the temptation. Right, for sure. You can also study the way that stories work. You know, this is a big thing transitioning from photography to, to video is a three-act structure, a uh, story arc, the hero's journey. Um, to take a little side trip, uh, Ryan, both you and I just recently saw the film Free Solo, and it gets at a few of the things that I was bringing up in our interview with Chris, which is that, yes, it was a climbing film, and yes, it had outstanding 
nerve-wracking, sweat-inducing visuals, but it was at its heart a human story with a very specific structure. A, a person who has a vision, and then he fails at the vision, and then he achieves his vision. And, and you know, at, at the core, that is kind of how most of our trips in the backcountry pan out. And, and there's always heartache and failure and, and challenge and uh, discontent and, and struggle. And, and capturing that as part of your story uh, when you're creating your film is, is really important so that you can bring the, the viewer on a, on a journey that's an emotional and rewarding one for them as well. And listeners, you, you have to go see Free Solo as soon as you can. It is really an outstanding film. It is. It's awesome. All right. Our next question is, what is the most efficient use of my money? Uh, well, you know, every photographer who has made their living off photography will probably say lenses. And I know photographers that um, build their entire kit around one lens that allows them to achieve the the vision they want as a photographer. And I have another friend who, like he has a specific Canon lens that he loves and a specific Nikon lens that he loves. And he does not care what body he shoots with. And so he'll he'll pick whatever body he wants at the time and use the appropriate adapters to allow that lens to work with the body. So that's always been really interesting to me that it was always about the lenses for those guys. And um you know, in the in the backcountry, you can take as a DSLR photographer, you can take some enormously expensive lenses out there. Some of these things are several thousand dollars. Oh yeah. And and to me, that's like, oh boy, I hate to drop one of those out there. And so, you know, obviously uh, taking taking expensive glass and and figuring out how to protect it in the in the face of you know dropping on a rock or or using it in inclement weather, obviously a, a real high priority for people. Now, for me on the other end, you know, I'm a I'm a smartphone photographer primarily, and so. Um, as I said before, the two most important things for me are stable footage and good audio, and that's where I invest my money. So um, I take a small tripod that's like non-negotiable because I want to be able to use it for stationary shots. And as well, the, the tripod in hand allows me to hold the smartphone in a much more stable position if I'm doing handheld footage or I'm panning or anything like that. And then I, I look for good audio. So I invest on the lightest, um, highest quality microphone that I can take. And, you know, uh, I, to me, that's, those are the important things. Do you have any favorites in terms of your external microphones? We could put a link to in the show notes. Yeah. My, my current microphone of choice is a Rode video micro. And this is a three inch long microphone that can plug directly into a smart smartphone. And I have a, a dead cat that I can put over it. It's a little fluffy, fluffy thing that uh, cuts the wind noise and it creates remarkable audio. It's actually what I'm using right now to record the podcast on. Okay. So the next question is, are there any ethical or philosophical reasons not to take pictures or make videos in the backcountry? Yeah, I think there's a few. I think that as saturated as we are with screen time um, at the moment, I think part of the reason that a lot of us go into the backcountry is to get away from all of these technological things. So you may not necessarily want to be sitting in your tent after dark, you know, blasting blue LED light into your into your retinas, um, editing your footage for the night. I think that there's something to be said also for uh, being in the present moment and maybe just watching a sunset or a sunrise without feeling like you have to be thinking about your Instagram feed, you know, at, while you're doing that. Yeah, for sure. I will say this um, as well, although this this doesn't directly address using or not using a camera, but um, in my experience with being on shoots in the backcountry with big cameras versus being on shoots in the backcountry with little cameras like cell phones and GoPros, um, the use of cell phones and GoPros are much less intimidating to the actors in the film. And so I, I think that you tend to get more real reactions from people when you don't have this uh, DSLR with a long lens staring at them in the face and a boom pole with a mic over their head. 
and it you it's more spontaneous and real and and I like it much better. So um, it it drops the guard to people if you can miniaturize this and make the gear less intimidating. Oh, that's a really interesting point. That kind of leads into my next thing, which was going to be drones, which can also be really distracting, not only to the people who are out there making a film with you, but also just to anybody else who who happens to be walking by, you know, uh, staring out over a beautiful view and suddenly a drone buzzes by you is, is not everyone's favorite thing. Yeah. And, you know, in the past couple of years, uh, Stephanie and I have experienced it far more and I don't know what to think about it. I, I own a drone. I love flying it. It's really fun to fly. The footage you get out of it is beautiful and unique, but I'm conflicted about it. Um, you know, obviously you can't use a drone in a wilderness area, a designated wilderness area, but you can use it just about any, any place else for personal enjoyment. And yeah, I, I struggle with it. Um, I, 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 don't like hearing them over my head when I'm trying to visit a, a quiet place for some recharge. Yeah, there's no easy answer, I think. And we'd be interested in hearing what you guys have to think. So if anyone's got any thoughts about that, um, feel free to send us an email. All right, our last listener question was about batteries, how to keep your tech juiced up. To answer that, we'll move right on into our gear section. Ryan, it seems to me that there's three basic strategies to keeping your gear charged, solar, spare batteries, and power banks. Yeah, let's talk about solar. Everybody thinks solar is the is the greatest thing since peanut butter for the backcountry, but really there are only two scenarios where solar is worth it for recharging your gear. The first scenario is that if you're on a very long trip and a very long trip is a trip that you don't have access to electricity on a regular basis. So through hike doesn't count. We're talking trips that are at least a couple to several weeks in duration in a remote location where you have to carry all your gear. So you don't have access to horses or anything like that, or there's an expense issue, a budget uh, associated with your with your production, so to speak, then you can't afford all the extra batteries. So that's one situation you need. Solar really only works on very long trips. The second thing is time. Solar takes time to recharge um, a lot of stuff. And so unless you have the luxury of sunny days and lots of time to recharge batteries, solar is not going to be a very practical solution for you. So for me, I've always gone the spare batteries route. Uh, batteries can be purchased quite cheaply, especially, you know, third party batteries, which can be just as good, if not better than, than the, the stock batteries that ship with your device. And, um, the best thing I like about batteries is that they're really easy to use. You just, you pop an old one out and you pop a new one in and you're ready to go. There's no interruption to your, your workflow. And then there's power banks, and I do use power banks, especially for recharging my phone, obviously, because I am i don't have the luxury of, of being able to swap phone batteries in and out on an, on an iPhone. So mm -hmm. the the power bank is used to recharge rechargeable devices where I don't have a swappable battery. So my phone, my GPS watch, my uh, Garmin inReach, things like that. But, you know, if I'm taking a, a camera that has swappable batteries, I'll take spare batteries. And then, you know, we can talk about charging strategies using power banks to charge either devices or batteries. And I think one of the big things is uh, keep your batteries warm. And when you're using a battery, drain your battery all the way down before you recharge. It will allow the battery to hold um, more charges throughout its lifetime and you'll get more, more juice out of it for the cost of the battery. Well, we will dig more into how to keep batteries warm and extend their life here in just a second. Um, I want to move into our next segment, which is hiker hacks. Now in the last episode, we talked about strategies for drying out hydration bladders, uh, for storage. Ryan had a pretty good solution. We'll put a link back to that episode in the show notes in case you missed it. Uh, we also had some listeners send in some very creative solutions. Uh, interestingly enough, both of the solutions we got just shortcut the problem of drying out the bladder entirely. So we had a listener named Sebastian who lives in Peru where it's very humid. 
Um, and he suggests just keeping the bladders full of water long term, especially if you use them regularly or semi regularly. His logic here is that in most developed countries, you know, the tap water is going to keep for a long time, or you could always use bottled water. He cleans the bite valve on occasion. And if there's, uh, if he's ever really worried about any kind of bacteria, he drops some aquamaria in there just to freshen it up. Uh, it makes sense to me in a place like Peru, where I'm guessing it's difficult to get anything at all to dry out ever. Yeah, I get, I get nervous about this sort of thing because I know that bacteria like to grow in moist, wet environments, especially in water that has trace amounts of organics and and that's most of our water so i think you need to qualify this suggestion and he did say tap water and tap water usually has some type of disinfection residual in it like chlorine and i think that's an essential ingredient to make the strategy work now he did say um, you could drop some aquamira in there to freshen it up that would also help as well so um, yeah i would say this is a good strategy, but make sure there's some residual disinfectant in there to preserve it. So Pete lives in the Northeast and his solution is kind of the opposite of Sebastian's. He drains his bladder as much as possible and then he throws it in the freezer when he gets back from a trip. So when he's ready to use it, he runs it under some warm water and he's ready to go. He says he's been doing this a long time with multiple bladders and has never had a problem. So I really kind of like this solution, especially in the summer for day hiking and things like that, because I can pull a half full frozen bladder out of the freezer, fill the rest up with water, and I have cold ice water for the rest of the day. So I'm I'm kind of intrigued by this. I might try this. Yeah, I'm going to try it too. Well, these are cool ideas, y'all. BPL listeners are creative thinkers, which is not surprising to me. Um, well, today's hiker hack topic is how to extend the battery life of electronics in cold temperatures. If you've ever tried to use electronics on a winter trip, you know that the cold can sap energy from those batteries, sometimes very quickly and unexpectedly. This is particularly true for these rechargeable lithium ion batteries that power most of our electronics. So the only thing I know to do is to keep those batteries close to you at all times, inside your insulation layer, down in your sleeping bag, etc. Ryan, do you have any other suggestions for this common problem? Yeah, first let's identify what cold means. Okay, so cold for one person might mean 40 or 50 degrees. And for the most part at these temperatures, 40 to 50 Fahrenheit, um, most rechargeable lithium batteries perform just fine and you don't need to do anything too special with them. As the temperature drops below freezing, then there are definitely some issues. and if you're shooting below you know, the teens or even below zero, then you really got to pay attention to what you're doing with battery management. So for me, my winter uh, routine is I always remove the battery from the device to keep the battery warm. Uh, and this is shooting with devices, obviously, that um, have uh, removable batteries like a DSLR or something like that. So I'll keep the camera outside my body and keep the batteries in my pants pocket. And then when it comes time to shoot a scene or take some pictures, I will remove the camera from, or remove the battery from my pants pocket. Remember the battery's warm, pop it in the DSLR, do my shooting, pop the, pop the battery back out and put it back into a warm environment. Now, a lot of people think, well, I'll just put my camera inside my jacket. I don't recommend this because condensation that causes when you bring a warm camera into a cold environment can be extreme. It can um, create condensation on your lenses, on your viewfinder. It can do damage to the circuitry. So your, your camera really needs to stay out in the cold. So uh, this is mostly true as you get into very cold temperatures below about 15 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Now with devices like a smartphone where you don't have that luxury, this is another reason why I like a, a waterproof device. For one thing, if I take my smartphone out of a warm inside pocket, for example, and bring it outside, I know that external moisture is not going to get inside the camera. Now, there's still some condensation risk because there may be humidity inside the circuits and things like that. So I try to do what I can um, as fast as possible to, to preserve the integrity of the device. Well, listeners, we would love to know if you've come up with any creative solutions for how to keep batteries warm or even how to solve some electronic condensation issues. Uh, please email us at podcast at backpackinglight.com. 
All right, Ryan, we're going to move into our last segment here and now where we talk about things we've got going on lately. So what have you been up to? Yeah, well, uh, in line with this episode, I am studying and practicing and looking at kind of state of the art mobile device filmmaking. And so I'm using uh, an iPhone and and have coupled that to the Rode video mic, which I mentioned earlier. And I'm I'm starting to experiment with some external lenses. I'm using some lenses from Moment right now, a wide angle and a telephoto. And so I'm excited to see what I can do uh, with that kit and then using a manual app like Filmic Pro to create content, um, good quality content rapidly from, you know, my day-to-day outdoor activities. Sweet. How about you? Where are you at right now? What are you doing? Well, I am full on in gear testing mode at the moment. I've got a whole box of fun stuff that BPL sent me that I'm looking at right now. Nemo just released a new closed cell sleeping pad called the Switchback, which they claim is the first advance in this product category in in a few decades. It's a pretty bold claim. I've been giving it a try on the floor of my of my cabin in front of the fire. Uh, so far, so good. I'm I'm hoping to take it out onto the Tahoe Rim Trail here in a few weeks. What is the advance that you're that you're looking at? They say that um, the way that they've designed the little the little nodules on the pad that for how large it is, how much bulk or volume it takes up when folded up, is significantly small compared to how thickly it sleeps if that makes sense interesting so they're basically saying they can squeeze more r value out of a thinner pad yes um and i I haven't done any side-by-side comparisons and i haven't uh, actually measured to see how it holds up compared to something like the thermo rest ridge rest or the z rest or anything like that but i am intrigued by the claim so we'll, we'll throw some measurements at it here in the next few weeks and see how it holds up Sounds great. Another thing I'm looking at is from a company called Brainia, and I actually typed that into to Google to make sure I was pronouncing <laughs> it correctly. Um, and <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're from Norway. They outfitted uh, Hillary's Everest expedition, so they have pretty good pedigree. And they're doing this thing with merino wool where they turn it into a mesh rather than a knit fabric. And the idea is that the mesh insulates just as well, but it dries faster and it breathes better. It seems like it's also a little bit sturdier than a knit merino base layer, which I tend to just eat through like like crazy. So we'll see how that goes. So pronounce the pronounce the name again. Brainia. Brainia. Okay, so this is B R Y N J E, and correct. I've been wearing their their polypropylene base layers for several years in the winter, and I love them. Now these are these are full on fishnets, so. Modesty aside, um, they have a very unique construction that is unlike anything that is available in the United States. So, yeah, I'm I'm very interested in see what you come up with. Yeah, I took a I took a picture uh, wearing mine when it showed up at the house and uh, sent it to my wife, and it it, it she thought it was hilarious because um, it it really does. It looks like you're going clubbing at a midnight sunrise <laughs> in Norway. Uh, That's awesome. So I guess it's a it's a multi use garment. It is, yeah. So you know how they say a lot of American outdoor apparel manufacturers will say, "Hey, this this works from the trail to the bar." So maybe you'd be onto something too. <laughs> All right, we'll see. I'll put a <laughs> I'll, I'll throw that picture up in the show notes in case anyone really <laughs> wants to see what we're talking about. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. This was a, a jam-packed episode full of lots of cool stuff, so it was a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was really neat to dive deep into cameras and photography. Well, this podcast is brought to you by BackpackingLight.com, which has been providing information and education about lightweight wilderness travel since the year 2000. The Backpacking Light podcast is supported by subscription fees paid by our loyal website subscribers, and we're extremely grateful for your support. A BackpackingLight.com subscription can save you time and money on your quest to lighten your pack weight, spend more time in the outdoors, and connect with a community of like-minded hikers. So if you aren't yet a BackpackingLight.com subscriber, please consider subscribing and gain access to nearly a million forum posts, 4 million words of original content, more than 2,000 articles, and access to our Wilderness Adventures Trekking Program. You can subscribe online right now at backpackinglight.com slash subscribe. 
And if you have feedback, questions, or tips for our listeners, please share them via email at podcast at backpackinglight.com. You can download the show notes for this episode by visiting backpackinglight.com slash podcast. And this podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Leave us a review if you can. It helps other people find the show and gives us some great feedback. Well, thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one parting message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody. So I shoulder my backpack, walk away from the car. 